I like being a writer who's writing on my own. Yeah. So I'm the kind that, you know, shuts my study door and <laughs> may God help the person who opens that door. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of emotion that's roiling in the room. <laughs> Team Agad's podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is where we try and go um, uh, uh, behind. Uh, uh, we try and go behind the scenes to figure out uh, the thoughts that animate the actions of those who create the arts. And uh, today, of course, uh, very, very privileged to have uh, the wonderful uh, Chitra Banerjee Devakaruni with us. Uh, check this out. This is a new book. It's called Independence. Uh, Amitav Ghosh has written something very interesting. Uh, a spellbinding saga of the decolonization and partition uh, of the Indian subcontinent with a cast of vividly drawn, compelling characters. Uh, you know, um, it's always said that if we don't learn from the mistakes of our past, we are, uh, uh, we are doomed to repeat them. Uh, you seem to be dwelling in the past a little uh, uh, to give us a little bit of a lesson in this one, isn't it? Yes, I think this is such an important moment in our history right? The nation is being born. And it is really important to see what we can applaud, what we can learn from, what we can appreciate, and also to look at the great tragedies that occurred at the same time as the greatest joys, of right? the partition and independence, they're two sides of the same coin. And one of the things that is really important, and I recognize this only when learning it, when uh, doing research and writing it, is that the people who lived through it are dying out. Sure. But does that mean that uh, 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 the wounds and the joys are, are, are fading out a little for, the, uh, for a whole generation? For the newer generations who were born into a free India, I think both of those things, the joys as well as those terrible occurrences, aren't real anymore. And I understand the importance of living in the present, but the problem is if we don't learn from the past, as you said, we might be repeating it. And I think that's very important to remember in today's India, to remember that a whole nation of people of many backgrounds and many religions fought together to make India free. There's, there's also uh, uh, this thing about uh, the fact, ma'am, that uh, would you, uh, w sometimes one feels that uh, the wounds that the partition left behind sometimes overshadows the joys of a new nation, uh, especially uh, narratives that are sometimes, uh, that sometimes get built also, uh, tend to delve more on the, uh, on the pain rather than the joy. Would you agree? I think that depends on the writer. In independence, I wanted to balance both because I do think they were balanced. You know, I remember as I was growing up, my grandfather and my mother, who both lived through this time and lived in Kolkata and in nearby village, very much like in uh, the novel Independence, when they talked about it, it was kind of balanced. Yes, there were terrible things that happened. Kolkata had its share particularly of violence, of but the joys also. You know, the, the wonderful thing about raising your head high and saying, this is my country, I am the citizen here. Wow. Yes. My people are ruling now. Absolutely. It was a big, big change after so many years of the British being in power. And it's such a wonderful thing that you say because, uh, uh, you know, it's important to remember the nuance of pride because uh, uh, there are thin lines there as well, aren't there? Yes, yes. Uh, we have to be aware of all of these things. <laughs> uh, then, of course, uh, you know, there, there's the recent past and then uh, 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 there's, uh, there's the mythology or our, um, our sacred text, so to speak. Um, the, uh, the Palace of Illusions is just such an incredible read because uh, it's Draupadi's perspective. Uh, uh, Mahabharat as a, um, as a tome uh, is just uh, such a, a vast repository of uh, interpretation, so to speak. Um, what was the thought behind choosing this particular version? Well, for a long time, I think in all my work, my work is very woman-centric. Sure. And I always felt as a student of literature myself that for centuries we've had men tell stories, most often focused on the lives of men sure. and the achievements of men. And even when women come in, they're seen through the male gaze and often seen on the peripheries of the actual action. Sure. And that is true in the Mahabharata as well and in the Ramayana as well. 
that the stories and the heroes and the big scenes, as it were, <laughs> they're all very male centric. It's battles, it's weapons, it's, you know, the intrigue that's going on in the courtroom uh, as people are playing dice. Sure. But okay. I wanted to know, well, what were the women thinking, and especially a strong and complex character like Draupadi? I wanted to tell the whole story from her point of view. Uh, what kind of research was involved uh, uh, in the storytelling, ma'am? Was there research involved? Was there, uh, uh, is there research available uh, for something like this? Yes. I had to do a lot of research. Actually, Palace of Illusions took me a long time to write. Exactly. Because of the research. Because I was going to create a different interpretation. I wanted to make sure that the research was very solid. That people didn't say, oh, you just made up this Draupadi. She is not true. She is not real. The Draupadi we have been told about, you know, she was, she was just trouble. She created the Mahabharata war. She caused all this devastation. See, that's what happens when a woman is too strong-willed. I was fighting that narrative. Yeah. I needed to make sure I had enough arsenal to say, no, look back at the actual scenes of the Mahabharata. So I did an extensive study of Vyasa's Mahabharata. Right. And then I looked at other versions, particularly Kashiram Das in Bengali, okay. because I grew up reading that Mahabharata. It would, be re it would be read to me by my grandfather, my mother, and so forth. I was very fond of it. And it was very interesting to see in both that although the glimpses of Draupadi are not that many, but she is shown as a very intelligent character and she thinks through things. And of course, she's going to fight certain things. Of course. Wouldn't you? <laughs> so would us. So I, I think we all would at some point of time. Um, but, um, you know, these uh, these very diverse threads uh, of, of information that you get, uh, got, uh, how, how did you, what was the process of actually weaving them together into the story? It took me a long time to, just to figure out the narrative strategy of Palace exactly. of Illusions. Yeah. But once I figured it out, I could reuse the similar narrative strategy for Forest of Enchantments, which is my story of Sita. Of course. And the narrative strategy was it's going to begin with the birth of the main character. It's going to end with the death or the passing away into other realms of the main character. Right. So it begins with Draupadi uh, being told the story of how she was, quote unquote, born out of the Yagna fire. I see. Yes. Uh, Ma'am, also I think, uh, you know, uh, more and more, and this is of course uh, a personal ob observation, uh, it could sound like a generalization, that's why I'm making this distinction. Uh, you know, information and knowledge are two very separate things. I mean, you you uh, tend to take information and weave that into, uh, into the thread of knowledge, but with the glut of information that we have available with the democratization of the art, with the accessibility of the internet. Um, would you agree that the, the, the line between information and knowledge is, is being blurred a little and the fact that one perspective from the information bit is actually now beginning to masquerade as knowledge and being peddled as a perspective? Well, one has to be careful about this because, of course, information is very important. Real information, true information, not misinformation, which is also continuing to happen, especially in this uh, age of the internet. Sure. Uh, it's very hard sometimes to figure out which is true and which is uh, made up, <laughs> right? But information is the beginning point. I had to have all this information about Draupadi, about Sita, about the characters who people, independence. Sure. I had to research the age of independence, for example, and as much as I could about the lifestyle in the time of the Mahabharata, I had to start with that information. Sure. Then I had to process it. Then I had to decide artistically, what are my boundaries? Because you don't want to overwhelm the reader with information. Sure. You only want to give the reader what is necessary to encourage the reader to enter the world of the book. The, the titillation of more knowledge is there. Uh, but, uh, also and, and I just want to tell you, for the writer, it's a great temptation. It's a very bad temptation. And I tell my students in my creative writing classes sure. all the time, because actually doing research is easier than writing the book. 
<laughs> so then you start doing research. You're feeling very comfortable. Yeah. You're feeling very virtuous. Sure. You're saying, okay, this is almost like writing the book. Of course. And you could spend a whole lifetime just doing research. So I have had to actually stop myself doing research, saying this is enough to get started. If I get stuck, I'll do more research. Right. So, yeah, uh, important to know when to stop is, is a yes, very big thing, isn't it? Yes. Now, what, what kind of, a, are you a lonely writer or do you like uh, throwing ideas, bouncing ideas of other people? I mean, we've had lots of writers who've got various ways of um, sort of figuring out what is the flavor in that, in that sense. Yeah. So what's you your... No, I like being a writer who's writing on my own. Right. So I'm the kind that, you know, shuts my study door and... <laughs> May God help the person who opens that door. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of emotion that's roiling in the room. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but there will come a point when I want to share. Sure. And I have a writer's group and we share our work with each other. And we all live in different places, so we do it online. And it's very useful to hear from people that you trust. This is working and this is not working. But not in the beginning. Sure. I want to do the beginning part myself. The foundation is the laid foundation. solitarily. Um, also, you know, we are seeing across the world a hardening of stances, uh, a little bit of the inwardness of uh, of looking at things, etc. Is that a factor in the way you write? Are you second guessing the topics that you write about? Are you uh, thinking about ways in which you can explain to that a little differently? You know. If I were thinking about those things, I wouldn't be writing about these things, right? You have to write what you feel strongly about. But also, I have learned over the years that if you want change, if you want to start a conversation, being adversarial is not the best way to go about it. Being inclusionist is a much better way to invite people to come and look at things in a different way, sure. right? So that is much more of my approach. I'm writing these things with great love and respect, A, for our epics, B, for our history. But I want to point out things that were ignored, sure. largely because uh, it was not a woman-centric gaze that was looking at these subjects. Sure. Even in independence, when we're talking about the many wonderful things that happened, the focus is always on the male leaders. There were amazing women leaders, some of whom I bring out in this book, uh, independence and uh, but they were not talked about as much sure. I had to do a lot of research to get them into this book and that's the thing I mean uh, you know uh, we were having a wonderful conversation um, on a previous edition of the teamwork arts podcast it's there uh, uh, on YouTube shameless plug uh, but um, Kwasar Padamsi is is a young uh, uh, theater director um, you know we, we asked him the same question and uh, he said this there's definitely fear. He says that uh, we have actually self-censored while we make our creation in that way. We are also self-censoring, knowing that sometimes uh, doing that becomes a little important to just get it out there. Uh, what are your views on, uh, uh, on views like this? Well, you know, everyone has to do it the way they feel is okay and the way they feel safe because mm. otherwise you're just blocked, sure. right? If you think that, Oh my God, if you're always thinking this is going to get me into trouble, there will be backlash, maybe my family will be affected. How can you write? Sure. Uh, for, I think, writers of books, it's a little different mm. because when I'm writing the book, I'm just writing it in my study. And I'm saying, later I will decide what happens to it. Whatever happens to it, it'll be later. Let me just create right now. Sure. The act of creation is just for myself at this sure. point. Therefore, there's less self-censoring, I think, in my case. Sure. There was also a, a, a question that we've asked um, uh, other um, uh, artists and, uh, and creators in that way, which mm -hmm. is uh, about the responsibility of art. Um, Manoj Vajpayee said there should not be any responsibility that should be put on art, otherwise it weighs down the creative aspect of it. Uh, uh, the, uh, Shobha Day, who we, uh, who we interviewed recently, um, also said uh, that, uh, you know, there is a responsibility that... that that needs to be fulfilled because that is, uh, in a way, uh, what what art should be about. So, um, what are your views on the responsibility of art? Yeah, when I write my books, I have a vision for them. I want them to do certain things in the world. And then I have to put that vision aside and really delve into the world of the art, the, the world of the book I'm creating, the characters I'm creating. So, I have to remember 
the responsibility of art and then I have to forget it in order to create. Oh, wonderful. That's a, that's, that's a beautiful way of putting it, actually. That's, uh, that's important to remember as well for uh, everyone who's been seduced by the written word. <laughs> it's, it's always uh, important to remember from people who've done it so well for so long. Um, it wasn't that you started with the long form. You, you started with poetry. Uh, and then, of course, the rhymes went into uh, the, the verses became a little more prosaic. So, uh, so what was the development of that journey like? Yeah, so I, I have never been trained as a creative writer, although now I'm teaching in a very, a very highly regarded creative writing program and I love teaching. I'm a very tough teacher. I'm always telling my students <laughs> what to do and what not to do. But uh, I, would, I did not have that opportunity. It's a really a great opportunity to have teachers and to have fellow writers all around you. So I was writing very much by myself. The great books were my teachers. And I started with poetry just because it was the least uh, scary form. I could have a short <laughs> poem and then it was done. Of course. Of and course. then I found my poems were getting longer and they were becoming more narrative. Right. So something was changing in me. I was becoming more interested or invested in story and in characters. So the next step was, the next natural step was writing short stories. And then a book like Arranged Marriage came out. And I was very blessed that it won a big award, the American Book Award, of which course. I was quite stunned by. But it made the journey easier. And then I found that the stories were getting longer. So then naturally, uh, that evolved into a novel. Uh, <laughs> Wikipedia has some fantastic labels for you. Uh, there's magical realism, there is historical fiction, there's poems. Uh, there's also a little um, uh, uh, piece where it says that you've written a libretto, no less, uh, for, <laughs> for, for the Houston uh, Grand Opera. And uh, uh, that was actually phenomenal. Uh, uh, I think that's a, uh, that's a little unexplored as an aspect of your writing, is it not? Writing music, quite literally. How did that come about? <laughs> okay, full disclosure, I didn't do the music part. There was actually... Of course, music. of course. So, they, and they were very nice. They said to me, <laughs> you write the words, okay. we will figure out the music, the music to it. But they gave me some, like some actual direction. So they said, here is the white page. Fiction writers write from this end of the page to that end. Okay. Libretists have to use this little narrow column. The staff notations were <laughs> yes. the staff. Because when you write this much, sure. we can make the music to fill the whole line. But if you write this much, where's the music going to come from? So actually, they literally gave you the meter for your words. Exactly. That's just <laughs> absolutely... What was the feeling like when you actually uh, heard your words set to grand operatic music. How was that? It was that? very <laughs> wonderful. It was very wonderful. I was uh, kind of, um, yeah. You were just like, like a baby. Not I mean, bad, not bad. <laughs> I was like, that little line actually sounds beautiful when it's sung. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the But thing. I loved the story that they asked me to write because they wanted me to write about an Indian experience, an Indian woman who moves to Houston and what would be her life like. So. She moves to Houston, she marries someone who's not Indian, and now comes her first Diwali. And what would that experience be like? And of course, immigrants has been a, a bit of a lived experience for you in that yeah. way, and a, and, a, and a constant motif in, uh, in the writing as well. Uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, tell us a little about that, actually. Well, I think in some ways, immigration made me into a writer. When I was living in India, I had no idea I was going to become a writer. I always loved reading. I knew I wanted to teach. I knew I wanted to teach literature, which was my subject. But I didn't think I was ever going to be a writer. I didn't think I had anything to write about. But when I moved to America, and this is in the 1970s, all right, people, no internet, <laughs> no internet, yeah, no books. And only libraries. books, only libraries, <laughs> and, and phone really calls are yes, <laughs> and phone calls are so expensive you can't even call your family, right? So you write in these little blue aerograms, and it takes a month to get to India, and if you're lucky, it takes a month to get a reply. So I felt so cut off, I felt so isolated. I think I really turned to writing as you know, and an kind of an inner resource where I could remember things that I was afraid I was forgetting. So that was really how I became a writer. 
Fantastic. Which of course leads me to the fact that we're living in a world of listicles and you have uh, taken to the, uh, to social media like a fish to water. It's it's wonderful to see all the hashtags <laughs> and the Instagram stories. Beautiful. Um, well, well, you have to, you have to understand. I have two boys and many, you know, younger uh, people who are just like my children and they have been very strict with me and they have said, mom, aunt, etc, etc. It is time for you to go to social media. <laughs> so I said, okay, Facebook. They said, Facebook is fine. I said, Twitter. Twitter is actually where I have my biggest following. Um, I don't know. I can't understand it, but I'm delighted. Sure. But they said, mom, all that is old people stuff. Insta. <laughs> Insta. <laughs> That's where you have to go. So remember, Chitra Devakaruni, right? Uh, yes. That's what the Insta handle is in case you want to figure out the stories. They're wonderful. But uh, finally, um, you know, since uh, social media, I mean, listicles are the thing. Um, for young writers uh, who are taking their first uh, initial tentative steps in, into the vast ocean of the world, uh, uh, what, what would your uh, three to five points be for them to remember or to forget? Okay. Well, the first thing I would say is, just think about why you want to be a writer. If you want quick money, this is not your field. If you want great fame and quick, great fame, maybe a particular kind of writing, but not really novels. So think about what you want. And the only reason to write is that you love writing and you love stories and you want to create. That has to be the reason you write because nothing else is in your control. Even that is only barely in your control. Sure. So you don't know what's going to happen with the book. I never know when I write a book, right? So I have to love the process of writing the book. And sure. I have to love story. Right. And I have to love a desire to tell the truth, even if it costs me. Sure. Otherwise, why be a writer? Otherwise, why be a writer? And uh, that's a question you need to ask yourself. And also, uh, remember what uh, Chitra has said, because thinking is probably a good first step to take. Uh, we're being uh, we're being told it's not a good question. Uh, it's not a good thing to ask questions, but maybe to yourself first. Yes. That'll be nice. <laughs> and and I don't want to be negative about it because the other side is it is so joyful to be a writer. When I'm writing and the writing is actually coming, it, it's like nothing else in the world. You feel like you're you're a conduit for some greater power. It's it's like amazing. I can't think of anything that's more worthwhile. So that's the other side of it. So yeah, basking in the reflected glory of a lovely ending by Chitra Banerjee Devakaruni. Uh, that's her latest book. It's called Independence. Uh, read it. It'll be nice to turn those pages. And of course, uh, if you want to know what's coming up next on Teamwork Arts Podcast, you just have to follow us on social media. Do that with Chitra, of course. Um, she'll be very glad. Yes? Yes, <laughs> I will be. Devakaruni Chitra on Instagram. <laughs> that's important. And thank you very much for watching. This is the Teamwork Arts Podcast. If you've enjoyed this podcast, subscribe to our channel now. We have a new episode out every Friday.